our planet is full of life. People, places, and animals. Inspiring filmmakers to explore. Finding new stories. Taking us on journeys of discovery into our natural world. This is Wild Lives. More than 1,000 kilometers east of Africa, nestled within the vast Indian Ocean, lie the Seychelles, a scattered archipelago of granitic islands and coral atolls. One of the most remote of these has become a sanctuary to a huge variety of wildlife, including several species of turtles, rays, crabs, and other marine life. This place is important for one animal in particular, sharks. When I first came here in 2013, we knew that there are sharks, but we didn't know how many. This small, isolated atoll has become a sanctuary to a staggeringly large population of sharks. Ornella and the Save Our Seas Daros Research Center team set out to understand why. Daros Island and St. Joseph's Atoll are situated on the Amarantes Bank. The atoll comprises of 14 islets and a shallow sandy lagoon. At low tide, it is encircled by an uninterrupted reef. Such a dense population makes this an irresistible location for shark scientist Ornella Wadeli. We need sharks in the ocean in order to have a natural ecosystem. Sharks are kind of the garbage man of the ocean, so they're eating the weak one, the old ones. So it's a both top-down and bottom-up importance that sharks have on the ocean and the ocean has on sharks. Pristine and uninhabited by people, wildlife on St. Joseph's has thrived. But just 250 kilometers northeast on the inner Seychelles Islands, the reality is very different. Unlike other iconic species in Seychelles, sharks are unprotected. Targeted by large fisheries and populations here are in rapid decline following a global trend. As a result, traditional shark fishing practiced for centuries is now also unsustainable. Seychelles is developing rapidly and has become a much more accessible destination than it once was, adding to the strain on this group of small islands and its wildlife. This is one reason why the isolated St. Joseph's Atoll attracts such a diversity of species. Over several years of careful observation, the team have gained some intriguing insights into the dynamics of life in the atoll. The tides that change with every moon phase. It gets from very spring tide to low leap tides. The atoll itself completely changes. So it also changes for the animals that live in there. At low tide, a whiptail ray seeks protection in an isolated pool, taking care not to become stranded 
in the midday sun. Each species has found a niche in relation to the rise and fall of these tides. Red land crabs descend to scour the exposed shore for food. As the tide rises, they are forced to retreat to the forest. Meanwhile, black-tip sharks explore and forage in the sanctuary of the lagoon. But these juvenile sharks are not immune to the continual changes of the tide. As the water rises, they must move to the safety of the shallows. The sharks have to be dynamic. They have to be as dynamic as the atoll itself. So they need to keep on moving in order to survive. When it's full moon or new moon, the tides are very extreme, and this allows bigger sharks, like lemons, to come in. You see them cruising along the sand flat and potentially hunt baby sharks. On the incoming tide, adult lemon sharks are able to cross the frontier of the surrounding reef and move into the lagoon. With their excellent sense of hearing, they can detect prey up to 100 meters away, such as crabs, rays, and even small sharks. The murky incoming water and the tangled mangrove roots offer some protection for a vulnerable black tip. But despite their size, lemons can maneuver in this very shallow water, often exposing their distinctive angular fins. They close in using special cells that detect the tiny electrical fields given off by all living things. A flexible cartilage skeleton enables them to contort in and around these confined spaces. This time, the black tip manages to slip away and the window of opportunity begins to close for the lemons. It will be another 12 hours before they meet again at the next high tide. On Daros, Anella prepares to go into the atoll to collect shark data, which she hopes will prove the importance of St. Joseph's. She too can only access the lagoon at high tide. When we look at the St. Joseph atoll, it looks like a perfect paradise island beautiful palm trees with the crystal clear waters, the white sand. But there's so many species living in there. There needs to be enough space for them. There needs to be enough food for them. We usually start with what species is it? What sex is it? What time? Which GPS location? And after that, we get into the more detailed information. Then 
Ryan will turn them upside down to see how his umbilical looks. And that one is closed, so you can write down number three. We put a small microchip, so in case of a recapture, you can read the unique number of each individual. Four clean, 55 on the dots. And we got a one. After a few minutes, the shark is released back into the lagoon. Ornella's vast amount of data will take considerable time to analyze. But one thing is clear. I had the most amazing time discovering this place. Over the last three years, I collected 651 individual sharks. So we can for sure say it's a shark nursery. The most important thing for the actual I think it's that it stays as it has been. There's nobody living there, there's no boats coming in, no fishing activity, and that's how it should stay and should be forever. St. Joseph's Atoll is one of the few truly wild places that remain for sharks. In our rapidly developing world, it is vital we protect them. Nestled in the Himalayas, one of the most unique species on Earth, the red panda, is in grave danger. The whole red panda habitat of Nepal has been fragmented into three other small patches. This rare animal is suffering due to human greed. Poaching cases of red panda has been dramatically increased. There may be fewer than 2,500 left in the wild. But there is hope. One woman has devoted her life to fight these forces, determined to make a difference. Red panda samrakshan gorna ko lagi adhi pani ma ekdam lakshu dherei vanda dherei. This is the journey of the Firefox Guardian. The remote forests of the Himalayas are the last remaining home to the magnificent red panda, lovingly called the firefox. An endangered species struggling to survive a devastating fur and pet trade. But red panda network has come to the rescue, working with forest guardians from the local communities. Each month, they head deep into the panda territory to gather important data and search for signs of poaching. But they face a huge challenge. Red pandas are hard to find. Only a handful have ever seen them in the wild. For one of them, it's been a long road to become a guardian. <laughs> Ramiro Gaurori Pari Jangalsa, Rabir Paka, Gornaji Kayuta Kolasa. When it's our Saga on that, he made a jungle for this cargo. Tibulam and Jamal Jaratis to Taratumi Koragon Tiglagora, or is a machine of wood bureau, Rudik Takiri Sano Sano Tirao, Urkira Kotru Tulu and Saki, three was Salas to most like the theater. I रेड पंडा नेटवर्क को महिला फॉरेस्ट गार्डन हो रहा यू मेरे को था वो मेनुका एंड हर टीम आर अबाउट टू सेट ऑफ ऑन देयर नेक्स्ट मिशन अ प्रीवियस ट्रैक रिवील्ड एन अबैंडन नेस्ट अ शोर साइन दैट अ पंडा हियर हैज रिसेंटली गिवन बर्थ 
आज हम उद्देश्य रेड पंडा खोजने खोजे भेटने उद्देश्य हो They're not the only ones praying for a successful mission. Last time, I was in the middle of the night. 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 These dense bamboo forests can be dangerous. But this is panda country. As an umbrella species, the pandas here contribute to the natural balance of this challenging environment. Kasi mala jungle jo ban gosti ke jada monitoring ma jada kiri gara bani ko pani pare ko time mali gara onsa jungle vitro kana li gotsa. It's the last week of April and monsoon is on its way. The team only have three days to complete their mission. Meanwhile, the forest provides important clues. Red panda le yo malia ko gas khaye ki khaye na bana ra yeko. Tara usle yo gas khaye ko ra na sir. And later that morning, the guardians trace the empty nest. You say two years ago, I did go to Red Panda Bus in town. Ra usle yehi stay town ma usle bocha jan ma usa. Abey yeh jawaru bottle ra raksa. Antes dulo bata koi bocha aru jare na mausan. Ra yeh Red Panda ko bocha aru mor ni karan pani yeh yes. Is ma saana dulo dulo ansa. Ante ay dekhi bocha talo chhiza. Pisli bata ko mor na shaksa. They then follow a route they believe the pandas may have taken. But as always, the Himalayas have other plans. Meruka's personal journey has been just as challenging. मलाई यो बंदियो सभी ले मलाई गौरी साके पचाड़ी इस तो उनसे बंदे था थे ना मैंने सब बंदा पहला यो फॉरेस्टर बने रह जंगल परवेश गौरी तीस पचाड़ी जंगल परवेश गौर रह मैंने यो त्यो काम पूरा गौरी रह तीस को अलग दिन बार अपना दिन पचाड़ी उन्हर ले सभी था बारा यो महिला बारा इस � महिला अरले इस तरह जंगल की नहीं नूरा इन्ना साकिन दे इन्ना ये काम करने की राम रोन थी रा ये गांव के लता यो फॉरेस्टर वाले यो जंगल की ना कौशली जानो की ना इन्नूरा कौशली महिला वाले इन्ना साकिन था रा आइले पुछ दाजी रेड पंडा रोचा तीती खेरा ये लिता मानसिप खांचा की जस्ट डॉर डॉर लागो मलाई ऐसे मानसिप तेरे ऐड देखरी मला आरा खाई आलता जस्ट लागे रा अंदर तीती खेरा तेरे रेड पंडा देखता केरी मलाई उप्रिनो जस्ट एक मेरे एकदम खुशी और सब को आंसे पन जारे जारो तेली कर दा मलाई एकदम खुशी ल With newfound spirit, the team follow a strategy to split up in search of the panda. As they head deeper into the forest, excitement grows. Menuka catches a glimpse of red. <laughs> but the moss here plays tricks on even the expert eye. And despite their bright red coat, the pandas are well hidden by these misty jungles. But Menuka has worked hard to see more than most. <laughs> 
रे एकदम ही मलाई मान पर्सा और हम अपनी इसमें काम कर से बंदा वो आर ले अब मां पुरुष और जति को इन्ना सक्षम होला इन पुरुष और ले करने काम करना सक्षम होला बंदा बित्रा देखे हिम्मत आए बंदे यो रूप में रेत पंडा को दिशा बेटी हो इले अब आमिले रेत पंडा बेटा को लागी क्यों समय पसी बेटी से तो आशा लगी रहे कि सब लाई यहाँ वो दिखाई सावध से लाए कुछ यो आनो दिशा हो यो As their second day ends, Menuka fears the team are running out of time to find the young panda. Darkness in this forest brings leopards and black bears. For now, the team must stop their search and seek shelter. उस लाये या सभी मानसिक आरुले उसको संरक्षण करें वो माने तीस को पनी संरक्षण होना चाहिए समाज ले गायो रसामुदायिक ले गायो पूरा अलग बढ़ते ही गायो अनेस्त अनेस्त होना रहता है बने पत्थरी वहाँ आरले नहीं मलाई और लेकर रसाये करने गायो So far, the team have had no success, but knowing this might be their last chance to find the young panda. They decide to explore an area where the trail is even more dangerous. Menuka believes this is the cub from the nest. It's a huge relief for the team and will ensure the cub's safety from poachers. Man, the light it pan na marne odi kar thay na. Sabai vanda uni arlay jai jana chetana ko kami ko karan le gar dahiri marsan. Ra isko mahatto na buje ra marna shaksan. Finding this cub is another success for the Firefox Guardians, giving Menuka hope that what she has fought to achieve is still helping to secure the future of her Firefoxes. किन भने यो रेड पान्डाको धेरै महत्व छ र यो गाउँ समाजले नजगाएमा अरु कसले जगाउन सक्छ र र हामीले नै जगाउनु पर्छ Deep within an Australian forest, a famous star 
is facing his toughest performance. A superb lyrebird called the Pretender. And his greatest fan is Jan. Male lyrebirds must compete to win the hearts of females. The Pretender is the reigning champion. But having lost a critical part of his costume, he has just one long tail feather left. Will he be able to stay at the top and remain the Great Pretender? Each winter, the Dandenong Ranges near Melbourne hosts the annual Lyrebird Breeding Contest. With lights, stages and dazzling costumes. The competition is fierce and only the best performing males will secure a mate. This normally requires two curved tail feathers, called lyrates. That's how the lyrebird got its name. Pretender's story is known due to the hard work of one lady. I just think he's magnificent known as the Lyrebird Lady. Jan and her team of Lyrebird enthusiasts have been watching the population here for nearly 60 years. We've got certain favourites that we love. <laughs> I've probably spent more time than other people um, with Pretender. He's such a placid bird. You can get quite close to him. And he's a little girl. Jan has followed Pretender for more than half a decade. She's won his trust. And made him into something of a celebrity. I think he quite likes the camera. I think he does. He didn't initially. So we used to say, pretend you've got to get more um, person friendly, particularly for photographers. But this year, Jan is worried that Pretender's time at the top may be under threat. One feather, that's sad, isn't it? Uh, one lyrate. That's a bit embarrassing. Something has been attacking him and he's dropped these as a decoy to get away from the fox. I would imagine it's a fox. It's like injuring your leg if you're a sportsman and you, you do a, a knee injury or something like that and you can't play footy for the rest of the season. Jan can only guess what the impact will be. I don't think any of us know what happens when a bird's tail is damaged. Um, as far as I can see, he's behaving absolutely normally. He's trying, he's calling, he's um, getting engaged in territorial chase, he's defending his territory. But if it's about his dance, his call and his display, one would imagine that a girl can tell that there's something missing.
As dawn breaks, males from all around are warming up. The first thing you hear is kookaburras, and then you hear the lyrebirds calling in the top of the trees. And then they tend to start singing um, against each other, singing in unison with each other. It is the battle of the bird mimics, and Pretender is an incredible ventriloquist. I love his kookaburra. I love his whip bird. And my absolute favourite is the little twitty birds. But now it's the costume round, and Pretender could be in trouble. And as rivals move in on his territory, his vulnerability is showing. A younger male in full feather makes his move for Pretender's patch. Vader wins, and Pretender is knocked off his perch. The next morning, Pretender is nowhere to be seen. You should put a radio tracker on it. It is the first time Jan has been unable to find him. There's not even a peep out of him. Oh, he's just not calling. I think we've lost him. I think we've lost him. But we are very near where the girl's got her nest. It seems Pretender's territory was worth fighting for. A young female has moved in. Maybe she doesn't know what to expect. <laughs> or she's not as discriminating against a male that's got a poor tail. And her inexperience is also showing in other ways. This girl's nest, to me, is like a gypsy's caravan. <laughs> it's got everything hanging off everywhere. Every time I've seen her run from her nest, it's always been with moss, and normally birds don't use that much moss in their nest. And just when all seems to be lost, there's another surprise. And it is Pretender. Pretender makes his entrance. And the young female can't help but notice. There's a little thing going on between those two. <laughs> if I was the mother of that boy, I'd say, hmm, I think he's got a new girlfriend. But will she choose a male with a damaged display? A 
A few days later, Jan and her team find promising evidence of Pretender's success. When she's mated, there's a little indentation in the, in the um, mound and then there's some feathers. Yeah, there's been a mating on it this mound. It definitely looks like. Yep. But can the cameras reveal the proof? Oh, oh look at oh. this. Oh. Gee, I wonder, he might have mated her there. Look at that. So there's the female and he's dancing around her. So maybe all is not lost. No. <laughs> and there she is there. So usually when she stops circling like that and he gets behind her, that usually means he's in with a chance. There we can see. It's great. Yeah, it's great. It just means that although he's got a lie rate missing, he's um, still able to mate. Maybe tail isn't as important as we thought it was. Maybe it's all about your song and your dance. Good on him. Yo lo maté porque Tú lo mataste, pues un león grandote, bien bonito. Porque me había comido una había comido el, la cría de la una cría yegua. De una yegua. <risa> y vino la yegua por nosotros a avisarnos y, y se iba adelante y volteaba a ver si los íbamos nosotros tras de ella y nos llevó hasta donde estaba el animal muerto. Lo envenenó al animal para ver si venía el león y se lo comía, pero no, no vino. Los perros que llevaba lo siguieron y lo encaramaron en un árbol. Entonces allá aproveché y le tiré un balazo y no, no, no le di. Se movió para otro brazo del árbol y ahí fue donde lo tumbé. Y ahí vienen con el león cargando en el lomo. Precioso estaba el animal. In Sonora, Mexico, in the rolling Sierra Madre Mountains, a small population of jaguars struggles to avoid extinction. Hunting and conflict with ranchers have shrunk in their range making these last borderland jaguars the most northern population in the Americas. But in this unforgiving land, ranchers also struggle to survive, battling severe drought, cattle disease, and hungry predators. ¿Cuáles son las dificultades que afrenta el tener un rancho? Mucha paciencia, mucho sufrimiento. Pues tiene mucho, mucho trabajo pues para sostener el rancho. No, pues mucho trabajo pues para uno solo. Y ya no creo que lo gente joven ya quiera venir a los ranchos. El problema en los ranchos de toda esa zona es, es la sequía, el agua. una de las más afectantes que hay. Las enfermedades, no hay asesoría por un veterinario. Pues, tanto el gato como el, el, el galaví, que ¿no? coyotes, hay muchos plazas de animales que hacen daño allá. Matar el animal que estaba haciendo daño, ¿por qué? Porque se estaba comiendo las crías del, de las vacas, de cerros, de cerras, todo. At the heart of this patchwork of cattle ranches lies the 55,000-acre Northern Jaguar Reserve. Here, water flows year-round and vegetation is abundant, attracting a variety of species from north and south. It provides a safe haven for jaguars and other wildlife, as long as they stay within the boundaries. 
Miguel Ramirez, a biologist for the reserve, knows firsthand the importance of this unique location. Es importante la conservación de, del jaguar en esta región porque es un área totalmente diferente a donde habita en, en otras zonas de Sudamérica. Esta es una zona muy árida, entonces estas especies pueden estar adaptadas a, de diferente manera a como lo están las poblaciones del sur, pues a la flora y fauna que habitan en el lugar por medio de, del uso de los jaguares como especie, especie sombrilla, le llamamos especie. Parte de la importancia de mantener esta población es que los jaguares eventualmente colonicen el suroeste de Estados Unidos. Sí, hay, había registros históricos de hembras en, en Arizona, pero pues eventualmente se, se terminaron por la cacería, básicamente. Es una tendencia muy fea de muchos rancheros que no tienen que no valoran los recursos naturales que tienen y eh, algunos todo lo que se mueva lo matan, ¿no? Eso es algo muy feo. Mi nombre es Diego Esrey. Quizás eh, 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 no soy el reflejo de, del, del ranchero que piensa, ¿no? El ranchero con, con unas botas y, y un bigotón y, y el sombrero y fumando. Y, el clásico, pero creo que en, todo, en todas las actividades eh, habemos de todo y a veces eh, eh, podemos ser mejores rancheros que, que los que aparentan ser rancheros. As a dentist and fellow rancher, Diego knows everyone in town and uses his influence to bring ranchers and biologists together. Cuando vinieron los primeros biólogos aquí a la región, fui presidente de los ganaderos y, y entonces ese puesto me, me daba libertad para, para abrir un poco la manera tan cerrada eh, que había de pensar en la región. Y quizás algunos me vean como una oveja negra. Me faltan algunas cosas que, que podrían mejorar, ¿no? Principalmente asesoría, ¿no? que asesoría para, para cambiar la manera de pensar y, y, y que valoren la gente, realmente aprend, eh, enseñarles a valorar los recursos naturales que tienen. Eso es lo principal. Esto es un paraíso de lo que tienes tú y lo estás destruyendo. Y, ¿no? Creo que eh, cambiar esa mentalidad equivocada. ¿no? With Diego as a catalyst, the Northern Jaguar Project started the Viviendo con Felinos program, and others followed, warming to the idea that jaguars can be more valuable alive than dead. Pues el, el programa Viviendo con Felinos, su función principal es eh, dar a conocer lo que hay en las propiedades de los, de los ganaderos. En los últimos días de cada mes venimos y revisamos las cerca de 65 estaciones de cambras trampa que hay en los ranchos. Mediante las fotos de, de cámaras y al mismo tiempo dar una compensación por foto de felinos. 500 pesos por gato montés, 1.500 pesos por ocelote, mil pesos por puma, cinco mil pesos por jaguar. Usamos las fotografías que tenemos aquí en el proyecto y las comparamos con jaguares de otras regiones aledañas a, aquí a la reserva o más bien del estado de Sonora, de todo el estado de Sonora e incluidos los avistamientos que hay en Arizona. Lo que esperan los ganaderos, al final de cuentas, es una recompensa por esas fotos y al mismo tiempo, pues, mmm, verlas, ¿no? Que es lo que les interesa. Entonces, el tener jaguares y pumas, pues, lo considero bueno y a veces podría ser hasta un poco orgulloso. 
Sin embargo, hay otras personas y lo bueno que ha sido que los rancheros que están en la zona de compensación de la reserva han cambiado su manera de pensar, han mejorado en, 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 por influencia de, de, de los biólogos de la reserva, eh, pláticas con ellos eh, eh, y actualmente tienen un poco más de respeto a, a la naturaleza. Now, 12 ranch owners agree not to harm any wildlife, effectively doubling the size of the reserve. Every month, Miguel gives each ranchero del jaguar photos taken from the camera traps on their lands. Entonces, por favor, revísalos, que todo esté bien y que todo concuerde. Recibos, eh, fotos y el dinero. El dinero. Entonces, ¿tengo febrero primero? Tengo una foto favorita. Eh, pues sí, la de los jaguares, ¿no? Unos jaguares. La Yuri, pues, pero ¿cómo le ven a ese animal de este jaguar? ¿Sí? Tengo muchas fotos, nada más que en, en cuadro no las he puesto, queriendo hacerlas más grandes. Que me gustó mucho este animalito conocerlo. De dos pumas. Se sí, pone sí, a ganar el primer lugar. Yo. Hay unas fotos muy bonitas. Este león en la laguna. La tampina en la laguna. que huellaban ahí las crías que llevaban jugando ahí con, el, con, la, con la madre. Está bien tranquilo el animal. <risa> porque quién es uno para decidir eh, si esa especie debe desaparecer o no. Eh, creo que no somos nadie. Somos, aquí nomás estamos por un rato en este mundo. ¿no? no debemos tener el derecho de exterminar a una determinada especie. Ningún derecho tenemos. Bača psa vodríka. Ten mu už od rokov stráži lovce. Na staré dni bodrík ochorel a stratil všetky zuby. Starého psa iba na smetisko, riekol Bača. Na čo chovať starú psinu, keď viac nevládze? Vzali si mladého psíka. Keď nadišla noc, mladý pes zaliezol do búdy a zaspal. Starý bodrík spával čujno, on i teraz badal vlka. Chcel preskočiť plot, ale nohy nič nevládu. Od hladu bola komucha. Smutne si za ľahne a rozmýšľa. Ech čo, keď ja nemám, nech má teda vlk pod zuby. Ani nezaštekal. In the Carpathian mountains of Slovakia, much has changed since the time tales of Bodrick were told. Old ways have been abandoned and traditional life on the farm is vanishing. But now, a threat from the past has returned to the forest, threatening the livestock. Chuvach dogs, like Bodrick, may be the only way for shepherds to protect their flocks. Can the shepherds look to their past for a solution to this new problem? In Orovica, Slovakia, Anton Jancho still uses the old ways 
to protect his flock. The farm lies at the edge of a national park that a growing number of predators call home. While the shepherds are hard at work, something is lurking in the forest, watching the sheep. But the shepherds can rest easy, knowing that the sheep are protected. The animals in the forest are also being watched by a group of Chuvach dogs. They stand guard, searching for threats and sensing if anything is wrong. But now, with his Chuvach dogs, Anton's sheep are safe. Across the mountains to the east, Chuvach dogs on another farm are dealing with an even larger predator. Brown bears hunt in the woods outside of this farm. If Dushan isn't vigilant, his sheep could be the next meal these bears have. Indeed, the dogs have been here for a long time. Jana Goliasheva has been a breeder for over 20 years and knows everything about the legacy of the Chuvač. Čiže při Valašském osídlení, někdy před, já nevím, třema, čtyřma rokama, došel s ovcama, s týma Valachama, s týma obyvatelstva, vlastně, co šli z rumunských Karpat. Když byli ty psi ve vesnici, v dědině, tak, tak tam ty psi hlídali dvůr, nebo to hospodářství, a ty psi, kteří šli na saláš k ovcám, tak ty hlídali ovečky. Oni se tam zdánlivě povalovali. Oni si tam leželi, seděli, a sledovali to. Vypadalo to, že ten pes spí, ale nespal. On pořád je ve střehu, on pořád dává pozor. But the Chuvač wasn't only a guard dog. They were part of a much larger life in the mountains. Then everything started to change. After World War II, shifts in populations and urbanization led to a decline in farming across Slovakia. As the people left the farms and moved to villages, the dogs went with them and started to become a domestic pet. Chuvach dogs like the ones at Janin Ranch, live a very different life to those that live on the farm. Instead of guarding sheep, these dogs are being groomed to compete in dog shows. But these Chuvach pets aren't for everyone. To taky vyčistěnců, jako byli na skanzeme minulé, tak z těch by se možno, já nevím, čím se dačo ujalo. Víte, to jsou psi jiné. When looking at a Chuvač puppy, it's hard to imagine it growing up to be a fierce, fighting guard dog. And while these pet dogs look quite similar to their guard dog cousins, their physiology has changed dramatically. Through breeding, the dogs have become smaller. Their personality might also be changing, which is troubling to one young scientist. Zuzana Buzakova studied the breed and is worried that they're losing their guard dog capabilities. To mě mrzí osobně, že tato jeho ta 
hlavná typická vlastnosť, že je to pes, ktorý sa dokáže naviazať na stádo, dokáže ho strážiť, prijať ho ako svoje, tak to už dneska nevidíme. A bojím sa, že sa to stráti. There are around 1200 pet čuvač in Slovakia and far fewer serving as guard dogs on the farm. However, an opportunity to increase the number of guard dogs may lie in Slovakia's changing forests. They once teamed with predators. They played an important role in balancing the ecosystem. Wolves in particular help to keep the deer population under control. But these predators weren't always held in such high regard, and by the start of the 20th century, they were hunted out. Now these predators are making a comeback protected by law and changing attitudes. But when these predators move into their old territories, problems with shepherds can still occur. Je pre vlka jednoduché uloviť ovcu, ktorá nemá prirodzené obranné inštinkty. Je to jednoduchšie ako loviť srnku. A keďže sa nachádzajú tie ovce pasú sa často v v tých miestach, kde, sú prirodzene, kde sa prirodzene vyskytujú predátory, tak samozrejme vlk si vybere túto ľahšiu možnosť. Keď ľudia zase pocenia túto ochranu, stát a predátorov bude prirodzene možno trošku vyšší počet, tak samozrejme zase vznikne konflikt medzi ľuďmi a predátormi. By using Chuvach guard dogs, the shepherds that used to defend against the wolves have a new role. With the ability to prevent human predator conflicts, these livestock guard dogs could actually help restore balance back to the mountains. And breeders like Zuzana are making sure that the Chuvach is up to the task. Toto je môj zámer, aby sa do chovu dostávali aj tie práve slovenské Čuvače a tým samozrejme aj um, táto tradícia, aby nezanikala. It seems a return to the old traditions of Slovakia may be the key to a new era of balance for the Chuvach and the wolf. Ide bača ráno ovce dojť. Ráta ich, ráta a tu jedna chýba. Ej, keby bol starý bodrik striehol, nebol by vlk ovcu odniesol. Privolá bača starého bodríka zas k sebe. Pekne ho pohľadká, poriadne nachová. Starý bodrík ovíja sa mu okolo dvoch a od radosti skáče. Večer už neleží na smetisku, ani v búde. Bodrík obchádza okolo košiara. V tú noc prišiel vlk a bodrík ho pomohol zahnať späť do hôr. Od tých čias boli ovce opäť v bezpečí vďaka bodríkovi. Tatar Salem Nyangan Zene, 
araky ny volana teo hoe no lataloha mipetraka tao anaty ala tao kay le le hira nandeha nanoka tsy vilany de napidiriny ao ny lohany hinan'ny raha tanatin'ny vilany tao kanjo avy tapoka izany le le olo le olo tompon'ny vilany de tsafaka tao ny lohany de nanena amin'izay izany Satria mety mikebo nga ny vilany na hoe salambay de hoe nataony hoe vaky, 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 vaky nataony. Hely matongany hoe maky. Today, the maki are one of over a hundred species of lima found in Madagascar, almost all of which are endangered. Like 90% of Madagascar's wildlife, they are found nowhere else. Madagascar is an ancient island, separated from Africa for over 160 million years. Much of the land was once covered by lush rainforest. But now, the trees have been felled. What isn't used for agriculture has been left barren. Seasonal burning stops the forest growing back. Nestled between towering cliffs, a tiny fragment remains. This is Anza, a beacon of hope and a last refuge for the Maki. Concerned that the forest was disappearing, a group of local people formed a community association to protect Anza and the lemurs. Uh, the Nyasa Tauku Sani Miasa Atom Fikambanga Yap Ma Miar Nyala Anishinatawe Ma Sharkan Pusatan in Ba Happy Travula, when he Fukunula Miarsi, when he found the Kanako Jason Tunganen and Urnani Fikambanga Yaru Nyala Anganza. Ni fukunu la mantul dan ni fata pakis sisi pikit pikit kasih ke sini baku ni hajar mui fa samisi ni pipu ku ami alang taming The association also established an entrance fee for the forest, which is used to fund a local school. Many members now earn their living, taking tourists to see the lemurs in the forest. Anumbuka tamni nishkwafa ni nyorova nanti zane tiamo atsapa we sanetli natau na ite walu. Toerana sisy hazo reny ezahana ho fenoana hazo. Fa rehefa feno ala izany manodidina ireto dia afaka miparitaka manao an'izao sy izao izany. The maki are the biggest draw for tourists to Anza. As Madagascar's most famous lima, many people come here just to see them. Over the years, they have gradually become accustomed to people. Nowadays, they have little to fear from humans. 
But this wasn't always the case. If I had an yellow honey, team in an annual mark you, if I knew Latanum ten fat. The Nishula Zane will the Punatifa will Fahine and Fin Ramoniati. These young Len Tarkelul Namun Bib. If not the people, the one. When I was in town, I was at the Champtani Nimak. I was at the Champtani Nimak. I was at the As the association brings real benefits to the local people, they have come to see the value of the forest that remains. And their feelings towards the animals are changing too. The Now that the association is well established, the true legacy of Anza has become clear. The way the nurses can in the way who say his fear of vengeance, the the fita tangana and fear of anani nyanza. Yeah, <laughs> Across Madagascar, Lima populations are drastically declining. But here at Anza, the population is over 400 strong. For its size, Anza has the highest density of maki in Madagascar. The future is uncertain for much of Madagascar's wildlife. But at Anza, at least, it seems the Maki are safe. Deep within the forests of a remote island lurks a creature with a fearsome reputation. Mm. 
Meet the Tasmanian Devil. But due to their legendary brawls, this irritable icon is now facing disaster and may be in desperate need of our help. When the first European settlers arrived in Tasmania, they were met by blood-curdling shrieks. Little did they know that this terrifying sound came from an animal only the size of a small dog. But these little devils earned themselves a formidable reputation. It seems these pint-sized predators have found their way to the top of the food chain. When the dingo arrived, the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger and the devil became extinct on the mainland of Australia. But we, we managed to retain all those species in Tasmania. We didn't have the dingo. In Australian ecosystems, where um, our fauna are mostly marsupials. Our equivalent of the bone-eating hyena or the grey wolf is the Tasmanian devil. However, unlike the wolf or hyena, devils prefer a solitary life. They only meet when they have to. When they mate, and eat. While they're the biggest pouch predator on the island, they rarely hunt large prey. The majority of their food is scavenged. But scavenged carcasses attract others. And that means sharing. <coughs> to thrive in such a competitive environment, the devils have had to adapt. It has very robust teeth and jaws for eating bone and consuming the hard parts of carcasses. And a notoriously bad temper. <coughs> They do not get along, so things usually flare up over dinner. Devils bite each other, and they bite each other a lot around the face and the mouth. They can inflict deep wounds as they squabble over food. But while this aggression appears brutal, it actually plays a very important role in devil life. Their battle scars are a badge of honour, the sign of a successful scavenger. Not to mention an attraction to females come mating season. But more recently, their love of fighting could be the devil's downfall. It may be natural, but this aggression has also led to a catastrophic series of events. Well, I'm, a, I'm an immunologist and I'm particularly interested in how cancers escape the immune system. Around about 1996, one female devil developed a cancer. A photographer was taking photos in a place called Mount William and he sort of wondered why the devil population was a bit low. But he also noticed some devils with these horrible lesions, and that was devil facial tumour disease. And DFTD, as it came to be known, 
was no ordinary cancer. This devil then bit another devil and transmitted a, a few cancer cells. When you think of all the cancers there are, and there's only three types of transmissible cancers, it is extremely rare. This tough and testy Tasmanian icon was suddenly vulnerable to a rare and deadly cancer. And due to the devil's naturally aggressive behaviour, the disease now threatened to spread across the island. And then that was transmitted to a second devil, and then in from two devils to four, and it's been transmitted across most of the Tasmania. Over just 20 years, the disease has eliminated some 80% of Tasmania's devils. But while some scientists have been looking for ways we can help the devil, Mena Jones believes an answer may lie with the devils themselves. Mena has been focusing on a problem created by the devil's mating behaviour. As males and females fight during the breeding season, transmission of the cancer increases. Devils are getting the disease when they first become reproductively mature because that's when they start biting other individuals and getting bitten. And they are dying within six to 12 months of reproducing. So they're dying at very young ages. But Mena and her team then discovered an extraordinary change in the devil's behaviour. Where there's very high mortality, there's very strong selection pressure for the animal to survive. We're finding that one of the responses to the disease is that devils are breeding much earlier. They're breeding as teenagers, only four or five months after they're weaned, and they're tiny little animals there. It seems the devils have started to mate before they are exposed to the disease. This remarkable adaptation has slowed down the spread of the cancer and has given other scientists like Greg Woods a chance to come up with their own solution. It's my total research now, understanding the immunology behind devil facial tumour disease. The next step is, is to develop a vaccine to protect devils from getting the tumour rather than curing devils with established disease. People might ask, well, vaccines aren't very useful in human cancers, but the problem with human cancers is, is that we all get a different cancer. But while this cancer can potentially be fought with a vaccine, it will take time to develop. The biggest challenges are developing a strong vaccine, getting access to enough animals, and test, testing enough animals in the wild. It's quite, it's quite an interesting challenge. There's lots, lots of questions we, we still have to ask. With time running out for the Tasmanian devil, it seems these infamous brawlers have found an even more remarkable way to fight back. Despite our best efforts, Mena has discovered an even more extraordinary response to the disease. So for the first 10 or more years, populations were declining precipitously. And we haven't seen any further population decline in those areas since 2008. We have also recorded rapid evolution in the genome. Now, if you put all of those three things together, I think we are seeing the early signs of the evolution of resistance to the disease. I think we're going to see changes sooner rather than later. And not only are they fighting back, they are doing so incredibly quickly. I've been talking about evolution for 10 years now, but I was thinking maybe 20, 30 years we might see some evolution of resistance in the devils. And I think we're seeing it, you know, within eight years of local outbreak. So people talk about, you know, we're going to find a magic bullet or a silver bullet, but really the magic bullet is evolution. And it's really a matter of watch this space. It appears this little devil, with a big attitude, is doing battle with a deadly disease. And some believe they may even be winning.
I uh, remember quite clearly walking into a small clearing, getting close to the Heron Colony. I looked up and I was right underneath an eagle nest. We realized these eagles were nesting right amongst the herons, and this just didn't seem to match with what we understood. You sort of assume the eagle is nesting near the herons because they're preying on the herons. Most people don't know the story. Hi, it's Steven. Hey, Steven, come on up. Thanks. Come on in. As you know, we have a heron colony down here below us. When I moved in to an apartment next door, the herons moved here. And I've been watching them for 17 years. The herons come every year, which is just remarkable. And um, just love to watch them arrive, and they, they mate, and then the babies come. And of course, you feel sorry for these innocent little chicks that are getting uh, torn to shreds right in front of you. So uh, yeah, there's definitely some, some uh, conflicting emotions there. Uh, Coming down to get some pictures of herons? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Just good to see people out looking at herons. And... My name is Rob Butler, and I have a PhD in zoology from the University of British Columbia. My name is Ross Venisland. Uh, the field I was in was behavioral ecology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Ross was one of my students. Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, uh, I've worked on a lot of different birds through the years, but herons definitely have a special place in my heart, I guess. They have this sort of weird, ungainly elegance that I find attractive. On the coast of BC here, we have the Fanini subspecies of great blue heron. The subspecies numbers about four or 5,000 birds, and they're considered a species of special concern here in Canada. It's funny, the neighborhood hasn't changed very much since I was here. This is where the old Point Roberts colony was. Be interesting to see if there's still nests in there. Aha. Here's some, uh, some remains of nests around here. It looks like a whole branch had come down here that held a nest. This would have been the materials that, uh, that the herons were using. So back in the day when, the, when this was all heron colonies, this was a crazy active environment. Hundreds of herons. The noise was unbelievable. Now it's just a quiet forest, mostly thanks to the eagles. Just a few years ago, these trees were home to more than a hundred heron nests. That's until a group of eagles moved into the area, terrorizing the birds and eating their chicks and their eggs.
We were pretty shocked when this place abandoned. It was our biggest, longest lived colony. But also very happy that they resettled not too far away. So uh, this is the Tawasin colony. Um, this is where the birds moved when they left Point Roberts. We were quite surprised they moved in here with a level of development, but even more surprising was they, they moved in and surrounded the active eagle nest that was here. So it couldn't be more obvious at that point. The herons were the ones following the eagles around. And uh, yeah, it's just such a surprise. Like why would herons be nesting so close to this eagle? Oh yeah, 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 look at that, right there. That picture says it all. So about four out of five of the herons in the lower Fraser Valley are nesting around eagle nests like this. The eagle is a major predator of herons, so why would they nest there? Back in uh, 2006, we had a, a really big windstorm here. I mean, I think the wind speed was essentially hurricane force. It blew the eagle nest in Chilliwack out of the tree. And the uh, heron colony started to do worse. The number of young that were raised in that colony dropped dramatically. The following year, the eagles came back, built their nest, and the number of young increased. We knew that the herons were nesting with the eagles, and we knew that they were doing better by doing so, but how did this actually work? Eagles set up big nests, and uh, they're very territorial around these nests. They seem to be looking up, too. There's an, oh, look, there's a couple more eagles over here. So that's what they've picked up on. And there's another one over there. Well, any eagle that gets closer to the nest of the nesting eagle here will be chased away. An analogy we came up with was uh, the Mafia protection racket. The Mafia is uh, making life difficult for the population near them. The eagle will take some of the chicks and some of the eggs. But they're also offering some level of protection. Look at this one coming down here. We're going to get something. Oh, look, 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 here. There's a chase. It's chasing them off. the eagle has provided a safe place for them to nest by keeping all the other eagles away. There it is. Whoa! <laughs> Look at him go! Whoa! Look at him, he's coming down, 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 down. So the herons that are nesting near eagles are essentially sacrificing some of their young for an overall protection. The herons know exactly what they're up to. You gotta remember that you only have one pair of eagles around that big colony. Whereas if you're out away from an eagle nest, you've got all the eagles with their eyes on you. For the herons, it's kind of the, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. And in this case, it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't. The white-tailed sea eagle is Britain's largest bird of prey. For many, it is the king of Scotland's skies. 
Once extinct on these shores, the sea eagle has now returned and made the Isle of Mull its home. It'll always be known as the first place that they bred. It was those early pioneering birds which set the scene for the, the return of the white-tailed eagle. However, for others, their presence brings peril. It must be really easy if you're, all you're into is eagles and you just see eagles, 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 and you blinker yourself from what happens beyond that. Local RSPB officer Dave Sexton has been watching and monitoring sea eagles on the Isle of Mull since the early 80s. Today he's travelling deep into the heart of Tiroran Forest to visit a very special pair of eagles, Fingal and Iona. We know this pair really well. Um, the female was hatched in 1998. She's a Scottish bird from northwest Scotland. Um, but the male here is actually a Norwegian import from 1997. So they're good, mature birds now and have been raising chicks for, for many years. This year, the pair have a hungry new mouth to feed. But already there has been tragedy. After losing their first chick of the season, Fingal and Iona must now work harder than ever to raise their only surviving eaglet, helping to restore the sea eagle's original population. We've got 21, 22 pairs at the moment. It's been between 20 and 22 pairs for about the last five years. There is still room here for more, and uh, we're not there yet. Whilst Dave has seen the population improve, 100 years ago, it was a very different story. We had systematically exterminated this bird, which was once the commonest eagle across the UK, and there we are, we'd just done it. We'd got rid of the last one. Fearing that these prolific hunters would prey on sheep, they were hunted, leading to their untimely demise in Scotland. But 50 years later, conservationists hatched a plan to reintroduce the native sea eagle from Norway. And one of those pioneering birds was Fingal, who, like Dave, was eventually drawn to the magic of the Isle of Mull. We were driving back along a sea loch and we knew the sea eagles might be around. They'd been released on rum, but they were beginning to explore and one or two sightings from Mull. And suddenly, as we were driving back, there was this massive bird flapping hard across, quite low over the water, over the sea loch. And we leapt out the vehicle and there was a sea eagle. And it was just an incredible experience. And that's what really inspired me to get involved in this project, to bring sea eagles back to Scotland. I made a nuisance of myself, really, by pestering the, the guys in the Species Protection Department, and I was sent on this secret mission to protect the only pair of nesting sea eagles in Britain. Dave continues to fight to protect the sea eagles here, and this year his thoughts are on the future of Fingal and Iona. Today he's heading down to their nest with a team from the RSPB. What we're doing is trying to ring the chick of this pair. The ringing process is, is really important because it helps us monitor the overall population. Justin and Lewis are now going to be measuring, getting the ring on. It's a British Trust for Ornithology ring on one leg and a colour ring with big letters on, on, on another leg that we'll be able to read, hopefully, from a distance. The team begins the long and dangerous climb to the Eyrie. They must work fast so the family aren't disturbed for long. As they reach the nest, they notice the chick is unusually docile, showing very little resistance. Then, as they prepare to leave the chick in peace, the remains of its last meal catches their eye. When we go up to visit white-tailed eagle nests, we sometimes find lambs in there, so we know they carry them in. The question is, how did they get them? Did they kill them? Did they scavenge them? Were the lambs stillborn? So many questions. For hill farmers in Mull, 
the Sea Eagle is a real source of concern. Ian Mackay and his partner Claire Simonetta fear for the lives of their flock, as the Sea Eagle's taste for lamb has once again brought the farmers and eagles into conflict. Especially it's lambing time, you know, that we really get the problems with the Sea Eagles. And they do, you know, take a lot of young lambs. Uh, it's an easy prey. You know, if anybody to turn around and say no, they won't touch it, it's sitting there, it's, it's easy to get at. So really predominantly at that time of year, they go for lambs. Certainly in the years I've been here, I've seen just how many lambs can potentially be taken by the sea eagle. Because the peak time for eagles to feed their chicks coincides with lambing season, Claire and Ian decided to try something different. In 2014, we actually trialled an earlier lambing season. So our lambs were born a lot earlier than the ones on the neighbouring farms and that actually resulted in all the local seagulls being drawn into our own area and just feeding on our lambs because that was the first lamb crop available for them as an easy food source. And we had the worst lambing in, in our own record since we've taken on this farm. So that was really an eye opener to, to the seagull. And as the island's resident RSPB officer, it is Dave who is the first to receive any complaints. Inevitably, some of them will take a few lambs each year as well. Um, golden eagles and sea eagles, they're big predators. They're gonna take a few lambs. Uh, whilst research and studies have shown a lot of lambs that are taken are already dead or sickly in some way, maybe previously injured by other birds like hooded crows that can do a huge amount of damage. They're either not believed or they're, they're thought to be um, biased in some way. But there is a much more enlightened attitude in, in the public. People want to see these birds. They deserve to be here. Um, and we just need to find practical, pragmatic solutions to helping the farmers live alongside them. But now Dave thinks he has found a solution. Luring the eagles away from sheep farms and back to their natural coastal home has really helped the local farmers and even created a new tourism industry. I think what we do does help the farmers because um, if you want to stop a particular predator eating one source of food, give it another. It certainly takes the pressure off the birds at a time when they are under pressure to feed the young. Obviously, if they're eating fish, then uh, it's doing good for the chicks and uh, they're not taking other things either. Martin Kivers has been feeding these eagles for a decade by mimicking fishing boats that throw fish scraps over the side, hungrily taken by opportunist eagles. People will flock for miles to get a glimpse of their impressive hunting display. But whilst the relationship between these predators and farmers is beginning to change, the sea eagles of Mull still face natural challenges. Dave's concerns are now mounting for the safety of Fingal, Iona and their chick. Some really unseasonally bad weather closed in. Storm Hector, as it was known. Very strong winds, cold and wet. Torrential rain. The storm battered the island and nest relentlessly. Iona could do nothing but keep the chick dry as best she could. But the next morning, Dave and his team could see that the inside of the mist remained eerily still. Our climbers went back in and very sadly found the chick had died um, during the storm. In hindsight, it was very well behaved. It wasn't that feisty and it's always good if a chick puts up a bit of a fight. So it was a, a sickly chick, unfortunately, and the storm, the bad weather was, was the final straw. So 
a really sad end um, for that pair. You know, you just you look at them and they just look a bit bewildered and they're looking at an empty nest. Um, yeah, it, it's it's heart wrenching to watch. Whilst it's a sad end to this season, Fingo and Iona will have another chance next year. The Isle of Mull is a real sea eagle success story. And now, a century since their extinction, opinions are beginning to change. The sea eagle, in my own personal opinion, is it's a big vultures looking creature. But it is iconic, there's no doubt about that. And I'm not here to say I want to see them eradicated. I don't hold grudge against the eagle. The eagle is an animal that's just trying to make a living. If the lamb's an easier prey than a fish, you can hardly blame it. We would all do the same. So the bird deserves no hatred or anything. Whilst some still see these aerial predators as a menace, for many they have become an integral part of this island. Mull is one of the key spots for them now across Scotland. It'll always be known as the first place that they bred. That'll never be taken away, so people will always come here and the economic uh, value of them will continue to increase. I hope sea eagles continue to thrive and I hope they continue to spread across Scotland um, into their former haunts. The future for the sea eagle is still very much in the hands of the people who share their highland home. But here on Mull, they are once again succeeding and even benefiting the island like never before. Here in a land where eagles dare, eagles thrive. In 2006, Daniel was a 13-year-old schoolboy living in a poor community on the edge of Sabo, Kenya's largest national park. This is his story. My parents died earlier when I was in primary. My father died through a little short caused by a buffalo. I was left with the three siblings, one sister and two brothers. My dream was just becoming a pilot. My name is Daniel Zuma. I live in the Tavo Corridor around Mongo Village and we're bordering the Tavo on the east and a few ranches on the west side. We are five of us in our family. and the two siblings who are still in school, they are all depending on me. getting a job in this village because basically it's a small village, no big companies and such stuff, so idleness is really, really a big problem. My dad was just a subsistence farmer, and apart from that, my dad used to burn charcoal to provide extra cash. Like Daniel's father, Many here rely on illegal and risky activities to earn a living because they have few options. So when Daniel's father was killed by a buffalo, the community mourned, but nobody blamed him. Life with your parents is really smooth, not that tough as 
compared to when you lose your parents. Tragedy and poverty had conspired against Daniel, but he was determined to get back on his feet. He wrote letters for sponsorship to pay his school fees. And when he succeeded, he kept on dreaming, dreaming big. My dream was just becoming a pilot, that commercial pilot flying commercial aircraft. But it was just a dream because I, with the situation after my parents died, I didn't at point think that one day I will become a pilot because of the financial sense. Daniel's luck was about to change. I started helping around Wildlife Works at their workshop. Wildlife Works owns a sanctuary that connects two of Kenya's largest national parks via an essential wildlife corridor. But this corridor is also home to Daniel and 10,000 others. Living in such close proximity, conflict is inevitable. 7,000 cases of human-wildlife conflict in Kenya each year result in the deaths of at least 100 people and countless more wild animals. On my way helping around, I met this guy by the name Rob. A gyrocopter pilot, Rob was in charge of a wildlife aerial surveillance team. He took me to college and I attained my diploma in aeronautical engineering. I started working at his hangar, taking care of his aircraft. The sanctuary between the national parks is vast. It's incredibly hard to protect with only ground forces. Gyrocopters have become an essential tool for protecting the wildlife and helping reduce conflicts with people. Currently, I'm helping with surveillance. We got every money. With a top speed three times that of an off-road vehicle, gyrocopters can respond rapidly to call out in remote and hard to reach areas. Having the gyrocopter airborne, having eyes in the sky enables us to identify where the problems are and get our range of force in to sort those problems out as quickly, as efficiently and as safely as possible. When we're out flying, we usually check out for poachers. Sometimes we get bad things like an elephant down through poaching. Of 13 elephants found dead in a sanctuary between September and November 2016, all but two were shot, poisoned or snared. I've been living in the Tavo Corridor for all of my life, but I never known the importance of wildlife till I started living with Rob. My passion changed all the way when I came back to wildlife, learning how important wildlife is, conserving it is, and that's what has changed my passion to becoming a bush pilot, uh, which will make me fly around conserving wildlife every day. The first time I was kind of uh, scared flying because I've never flown before, you know. But with time flying with Rob, I got used to that and I loved to fly more and more. And then, tragedy struck again. In March 2017, Rob suddenly passed away. When Rob's tragedy came, it just raised the wound that was like healed when I lost my parents back. Rob was like a a dad to me, 
Uh, he showed me lots and lots, especially on the conservation part. He taught me everything, living with everything. Taught me how to fly, taught me to how to sail. He taught me how to drive. That's how I remember. Uh, yeah, I'll probably never forget him all of my life. In the 12 months before his death, Rob, Daniel, and the surveillance team flew over 600 hours and covered nearly 60,000 kilometers. The elephant population here rose by 600 over the same period. I would like to be a gyro pilot to keep his legacy running on. Five young kids, Charlie Bravo, uniform, flying low level around the King Garage. And traffic, please advise. My dream was just becoming a bush pilot, conserving wildlife every day, every moment, and always. For me, nature is a place where I can escape to. You just exist there and then. It's mindfulness. I can completely lose myself in the smallest detail. And I come out of the ocean like as a new person. I grew up in Bulande, which is uh, a small archipelago off the western coast of Norway. It's quite isolated in many ways because you have to take the ferry from the mainland and then drive from island to island to get to the island where I grew up. It's a small but thriving community where everyone knows everyone and it's very safe. Most of the people here work with something that has to do with the fisheries. There's quite a few big fishing boats in the village and they go all the way up to the north of Norway and they fish for herring, cod, mackerel and seith. 
So growing up here is, I guess, a bit different from most other childhoods. Growing up here in the ocean is a big part of our life. But I think I was the one that was definitely the most interested in nature. I don't know why, but that's just how it was. I was always very interested in insects and the stuff that drifted up on the beach. And I had my huge collection of spiders. <laughs> so I was always a bit different. So the challenge of growing up in a small place like this is that you don't always have someone else that shares your interest. I didn't have anyone else that was really keen on nature the way that I was, so I was doing a lot of stuff just on my own. So moving away from the islands and studying my passion, marine biology, was really good because then, then I met everyone else that were also interested in nature, so I wasn't the outsider anymore. Being somewhere else, learning about nature and coming back here and seeing everything that we have here, it just made me appreciate it so much more because I didn't realize when I was a kid how special this place is. I think that most places on land have been explored by humans by now. But in the ocean, there's so much left to explore. And no one has seen these sites before. So I'm the first one to explore them and it's so exciting. A lot of people think that there's not much to see in the colder waters here in Norway and Sweden. But you have schools of fish, you have anemone walls, you have nudibranch, bright colors, fascinating animals. There's so much to see, even just when you go snorkeling. But I'm scared that all this is going to be lost. So one of the major environmental problems that we're facing now is there's so much litter, especially plastic, ending up in the oceans every year. And it's a huge problem. A couple of years ago, I went for a walk here on the island and I found a dead gannet. They had a rope around its beak, so it had starved to death. I picked it up and brought it home and I assembled the skeleton so that I could exhibit it and show people what the plastic in the ocean does to the animals that live there. So a lot of plastic end up in the ocean and breaks into tiny pieces and then animals eat it because they mistake it for food. So it's going to have a lot of consequences for us as well because the tiny pieces of plastic that are covered in pollutants they return to us through our seafood and it's going to affect our health in the future. So I get frustrated, I think, when people don't care about nature because if someone throws plastic in the ocean, it's going to have a consequence for all of us, even for our children and grandchildren. I think a lot of people have lost their close connection to nature. Even people working with nature and in nature and depending directly on nature doesn't always appreciate it for what it's worth. I mean, we are so dependent on it and we all sometimes take it completely for granted. But as long as people are not able to see what's there, they're not gonna care so much about it and so that's what I try to do get to get people beneath the surface. The projects that I work on are focused on what we call Nær Natur in Norwegian. So Nær Natur describes the nature that surrounds us every day because I think that people are more likely to connect to that nature and if they connect to it and appreciate it that they are more likely to want to protect it. I made a couple of films about marine litter to tell people about how serious this problem is and also try and inspire them to find solutions for the problem. 
And last year we made an outdoor photo exhibition to show people here what they're out to see in the shallows. And so we took photos from the local environment, just under people's floating docks, just outside their houses. When they get the information about what's there, people get interested and they want to try it out. So following the exhibition, three women from the island asked if I could take them snorkeling because they wanted to see for themselves what's there. They're not your uh, typical diver. They've never tried diving or snorkeling before. They've never even tried a dive mask on. So it will be interesting to see what they think of it. I was a bit worried about the snorkeling with the ladies today because it's still only 10 degrees in the water even though it's June and it's been really windy. So the challenge was to find a site where I could show them nice enough things for them to get excited about it. But we just came back out of the water and it was a success. They were really happy and they didn't think it was cold actually. <laughs> and they thought it was really beautiful. I think there's nature everywhere, even in a city. But it's really hard to compete with shopping and materialism and TV and all these things. But I think that once you get people outside and actually get them to see what's there, if I can manage to get them fascinated, you know, you can get past the idea that they have that nature is a bit boring because there's nothing more fascinating than nature, I think. There's so many fun things to do and it's so much beauty and uh, so many stories to tell. I don't think there's any point in pointing fingers because people aren't going to change if you do that. So I try to inform people in a neutral way and inspire them because we, we don't have to give up anything. We just have to change our ways. So I think we should just all try and find a solution together and think about our children and grandchildren. Nigeria. It has the highest rate of deforestation in the world, but there are still pockets of forest left. In one of these pockets, a passionate team of conservationists are about to attempt the largest primate release ever. With 200 monkeys to release, will they be able to get them all out safely? Beneath Afi Mountain lies some of Nigeria's last primary rainforest. In this wild place, the forest is disappearing at an alarming rate, giving way to cocoa farms. But in this last remaining jungle lives a strange and charismatic monkey. And there are some who are fighting for its survival. We arrived here on an overland trip in 1988. And there was a lot more forest then, there was a lot less people. Cross River State was really a peaceful place with a lot of beautiful forests. And we became more interested in this animal called the drill, which nobody knew anything about. Very little was ever written about it, so we uh, started a program for drills. Every day, a truck makes its way from Drill Ranch into the local village of Buancho to buy animal feed and to pick up their staff who are from the local community. 
what Peter and his partner Liza started 27 years ago with a few orphan drills is now a hugely successful breeding program and the time has finally come to release the first group of 200 into the wild. Emmanuel has fed the drills every day for 12 years. He's built trust that will be an important part of persuading them to leave their enclosure. So we are just gonna go in and feed them. They like mango, so that's why I see they're making some uh, screaming sound of hungry. Yeah. So they always do that when they see their favorite food. I feed them three times in a day. Sometimes when we have less food, we give them two times. My favorite drill is, the, is, is Glory. Because she's, she's close to humans, she's friendly. She, she takes what I'm giving her by hand. She always makes a sign that will make you come close to her for grooming. There are as few as 3,000 drills left in Africa. They live in groups of 30, led by a large, brightly coloured alpha male. These smaller groups often band together to form supergroups of over 100, one of the largest group sizes of any forest-dwelling mammal. Fighting is a big part of life in such groups, but no tussle is irreconcilable, and as soon as they've started, fights are usually forgotten. Drill Ranch is the most successful breeding centre in the world for drills, and it owes much of its success to its forest location. Without trees, drills would have nowhere to sleep at night. The nursery was just set up as a, a little example of what people could do here. And it was one of, one of the things I, I loved the most uh, in this place, and it's what visitors absolutely adored as well. The idea of doing it was to show people, you know, you can do this stuff our biodiversity and our environment is the mother of everybody here. And we dare not lose it. I'm a nature lover from bed. I always like to play with some little things like butterflies, lizards, and uh, I don't like killing. So and I don't even like eating bushmeat. I've been for Three years working here with them, so I enjoy working with the primates. My favorite part of the day is when I make sure my animals have food and also have drinking water. It's the first time we are going to release the trees. We're gonna be tracking them, following them whenever they lose, and some of the males are gonna be our colors. For the team to gauge the success of the release, they need to know what happens to the drills in the wild. They've chosen to fit five dominant males with radio collars, as where these males go, it's likely a loyal group of females won't be far behind. It's an important part of such a pioneering endeavour, and ultimately crucial for the drills' survival. Peter heads one final meeting with the release team. As Emmanuel knows the drills better than anyone, they ask his opinion on the potential problem. We have to go through and run all the what ifs, have backup plans, have people assigned. Do you think they're all going to leave or some will stay in the enclosure? Yeah, if you keep them hungry, they will all follow back. If they have something in their stomach, some will like to stay behind. Okay. Yeah. I mean, people should keep their distance from them, but be there if they decide to start going the wrong way to kind of discourage them, distract them back onto the, the direction we want them to go. Hmm? And if you're challenged by a male? Just look down at the 
I don't want, I don't yeah, want people down. to look down. At least run towards the wildlife sanctuary. <laughs> That's right. Tony. <laughs> With the collars fitted and a plan in place, the team need to act fast. Everything now rests on tomorrow, the day of the release. As the sun goes down, the drills go up into the trees, where they spend the night together in their family groups. Most of the drills here have spent their whole lives in this enclosure, and they know these trees well. If the release goes according to plan, tomorrow they'll have the whole forest to choose from. Peter hopes that Emmanuel will be able to coax the drills out of the back of the enclosure with wheelbarrows of bananas and bread. Everyone else will stay out of sight so as not to scare the drills, forming a barrier in the bush. The idea is to direct the drills onto Athi Mountain, far enough from local farms where they would likely cause trouble. With the fence open, the drills are free to leave. All that's left is for Emmanuel to show them the way out. Most of the group was held back by the supergroup alpha male, Atora. Now begins a new chapter for Drill Rush, as there's lots of work to be done to ensure the survival of those drills. Peter is worried about the future. In the end, it's going to be for someone else to carry the ball. I'll carry it as long as I can, it's for others. And whether they do or not is not something I can ensure and finding the people that have the ability to do this is very difficult. You need the passion. You need to be unreasonably optimistic. And uh, you need a huge number of skills. And so those people don't just fall off the tree. And you have to be willing to sacrifice pretty much everything. There's not too many people that actually are interested in doing that. Emmanuel's thoughts are with his now wild drills out in their new forest home who he'll spend the coming weeks tracking. I will be worried I will miss them for walking with them for a long time. And I'm going to be there with them, following them wherever they go, identifying them in the morning, the one I've seen, the one I've not seen, watching, following them to see how they will survive in the world. So that's my job. Deep in the heart of Germany, in a land dominated by structure and order, there is a wild place, an untouched forest. And in recent years, some of its magnificent creatures have been making a remarkable comeback. 
All thanks to the extraordinary work of one tiny creature, an architect of something incredible. Natural born chaos. Within the vastness of this managed landscape, there lies a pocket of wilderness where nature flourishes free from the order of the outside world. This is the Bavarian Forest, Germany's oldest national park. Here, a natural harmony endures, supported by the work of a remarkable human being. Every day, Ranger Mario Schmidt sets off into his native woods. A guardian of this unique place, he has a distinctive approach to his job. Die Ranger sind der Sprachrohr der Natur. Und weil nur wenn man versteht, um was das es geht, dann kann man das auch schützen. Vor allem hier in Deutschland ist so, das muss immer strikt nach Vorschrift gehen und da darf, da muss jeder Baum in eine Richtung sein. Das ist aber in der Wildnis nicht der Fall. His efforts to conserve this wilderness get a helping hand from natural disasters. In 2007, Cyclone Kirill ravaged this region with hurricane force and flattened large swathes of the forest. Winds like this prepare the ground for a destructive insect. Attracted by the scent of the weakened trees, the European spruce bark beetles attack in large numbers. Da sieht man jetzt, dass sich der Buchdrucker da frisch in den Fichtenstamm gebohrt hat. The beetles and its larvae forage channels under the bark. They cut off the sugar-rich supply of the trees. The spruces are doomed. Although weak when working alone, this tiny insect finds strength in numbers. Killing large patches of spruce, they are feared by landowners. So local foresters interfere quickly and remove the infested trees. They lay the blame with the park. Also, this argument is ganz einfach, dass wir den Wald sterben lassen. The bark beetle might seem to be a pest, but behind its destructive behavior, it has a crucial role to play. What if people like Mario don't interfere in the work of nature? Fungi thrives on trees killed by the beetle, and a new forest begins to grow as the sun's rays once again reach the woodland floor. And it's here beneath the canopy that one of the park's most flamboyant creatures makes his home, the capicale. All his attention is fixed on impressing his judges. He's looking for the right place to stage an audition, the perfect forest clearing. Soon after dawn, the curtain goes up and he begins to strut his stuff. Singing loudly, he is determined to attract a mate. Even if the hen doesn't hear his ballad, Perhaps she will see his dance. But maybe it just isn't his lucky day. Instead, he's drawn to the many blueberries growing here now as crucial sunlight reaches the forest floor. Since time immemorial, the woods of the Bavarian forest have resounded with the distinctive song of the Capicale. And nowadays, thanks to rangers like Mario, he can still find an undisturbed home on these woodland slopes. Meanwhile, today is an important day for his human guardian. Mario takes a special group of children, junior rangers, out into the woods and teaches them his craft. This is actually your time. 
Here he tells them about another little-known inhabitant of this magical place. The national park has been made by the elders and has been changed through the stürme, die wo stattgefunden haben durch den Burgenkäfer. Aber ich habe nichts gehört. Und vor was für ein Tier könnte diese viele sein? This is a woodland dweller that also gets help from these natural changes. The ghostly Ural owl is an elusive predator, flying silently among the trees, leaving its prey little chance to escape its deadly claws. In spite of these powers, the owl's queer sound has been absent from this place for many years. Recently, this haunting predator has begun to make a comeback thanks to the efforts of the rangers to preserve its wild home. However, challenges remain. There are still not enough old trees in which to nest, like this beach snag. So, for now, the Ural Owl needs help to repopulate this area. Dass man ihm so große Nistkästen anbietet. In early spring, the female answers her partner's call. And the couple start their mating ritual after the long winter. The male brings offerings of food to his mate. Only if he can find enough vole gifts for her will the female lay eggs. As the chicks don't hatch at the same time, there is little competition for food. While one sibling is already snoozing on a branch outside, the other one still cuddles safely in the box, at least until mum decides the time has come for it to explore its forest home. Made it! Almost. There is danger here on the ground. Lurking in the shadows, a martin on the lookout for a meal. The mother is quick to react and rushes to her chick's defence. For now at least, the owlet is safe. And only a forest with plenty of dead wood can provide enough prey for her young. Fierce as she may be with her enemies, she remains tender with her chick. Unlike his wild home, in a sterile, managed forest, the little owl wouldn't find logs to help him escape from predators. Once both siblings are up in the canopy, the parents' anxious moments are swiftly forgotten. While the father takes over the twilight hunting, The mum feeds her hungry chicks. If there is some food left over, the grown-ups take their share, but only once their young are full. While the owl family pursue its existence in the forest, Mario sums up the learning of today. The national park has been changed. Where are they entstanden? Natürliche Lebensräume. And these natural habitats are created by a small insect with a big impact. 
As the next generation, the children need to enlighten the park's visitors about these natural wonders. <laughs> the rangers to be share their knowledge about the owl's world through a quiz. In the meantime, Mario continues to guard this natural born chaos, an island of wilderness. So that for generations to come, the untouched forest can thrive freely, day after day, and night after night. The tropical Cuban forests are some of the most naturally diverse habitats in the Caribbean, home to many species found nowhere else in the world. 50 kilometers south of the mainland lies the Isle of Youth. With a history of pirates and gold, this very location inspired the great novels Peter Pan and Treasure Island. But these forests are critically endangered. A crack team of biologists and students, led by Dr. David Bird and Dr. Tony Cadez, are here to help. Their aim, to document the extraordinary range of animals found here, all in the hope of saving this pristine environment before it's too late. This might be a new species. Yes. This might be a new species. Yeah. Yes. With unprecedented access, they're here on a wildlife treasure hunt. Whoa. These dry tropical forests are the last of their kind. They remain largely unexplored and very few people have ever been here. After many hours of traveling, the team reached the remote location. They set up their basic living arrangements with only a small beach hut for company. With just 10 days on the island, the team must act fast. and Dave wastes no time preparing for the day ahead. But as the team make their way into the forest, they discover they're not alone on the island. An American crocodile. At seven foot long, it may only be a small one, but it's still a dangerous animal, and the team proceed with caution. Today we're out in the forest looking for reptiles and we've got an expert, Tony, who's going to be helping us identify them and catch them. The idea is to try and get a full list of all the reptiles that occur on the island. The chances are there are new species to be found, perhaps one of them might turn up here. It's not long before Dr Tony Cadez from Havana University has spotted his first target. He's good, isn't he? He's good. <laughs> Tony is an expert in Cuban reptiles, but even for him, the chance to visit this remote location is a very special opportunity. Not too many studies have been done in this area. We are discovering uh, species that actually haven't been reported for this area for uh, many years, and it's very exciting to find species that uh, for the first time have been discovered in this small island. Having seen how it's done, the team get to work catching any reptiles they can find. In this case, a brown anolis lizard, a very common Cuban species. Leaving the group behind, Tony goes off to see what else the island has in store, with the hope of finding some of the more elusive animals. Meanwhile, deep in the forest, 
The team are not the only ones on the lookout for lizards. The Great Lizard Cuckoo. Found only in the Caribbean, this is one of the largest species of cuckoo in the world. Its main diet, as the name suggests, is lizards. But no luck this time. As midday arrives, the heat is already taking its toll on some of the team. But perfectly adapted to the Cuban climate, Tony has returned after a successful morning. This morning was actually very productive. And uh, I'm going to show you briefly what we got. We have from lizards, different families of lizards, to uh, different kinds of snakes. First of all, ameba. They live on the sandy beaches. This species character is the long and thin tail, which can turn blue in several populations, even here in Punta Frances. This is a Cuban racer. They are actually so fast that it's not easy to collect. We have to jump on it, literally. They are fast not only for moving, but also for swallowing their prey. We also have one of the most amazing reptiles of Cuba, and it's called the Cuban giant boa. It feeds mainly on small mammals. It feeds also in, it feeds on bats. So this species is quite common within the caves. It's a very representative species from Cuba, the largest boa in the Caribbean. As the evening approaches, Tony presents his findings to the rest of the group. The other species we have here is usually uh, found on rocks, rocky places. Back at the hut, a new cast of characters have emerged. And Tony is still on the lookout. Yeah, here we are. As well as providing the team with shelter, the hut has also attracted a variety of visitors. It was fast. <laughs> but uh, I was faster than, than it. Actually, we, what we are seeing here is uh, the patterns of the juvenile as a red tail and uh, many bands in the, in the body. As the team relax, Tony's made an unexpected discovery. So surprisingly, we got another species of uh, gecko. Another species? <laughs> another species. What do you think about that? I've never seen any geckos at all before. Well, <laughs> actually, this is uh, the expedition for geckos, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, need to, I need to take it to Havana and check it, because I don't know exactly which species this one. And it could be a new record for this old island, for these small islands. Uh, so, I think it's important to take a good picture of it. Okay. Okay, let's try it with this. Uh... Let's hope he behaves himself. Oh, that, oh David, that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. An important part of David's work here is to photograph every addition to the growing species list. This is what you find on this kind of expedition. You get all these new things turning up which people haven't seen before. If it turns out to be a new record for the island, that'll be, uh, that'll be great. Tony's discovery of a new gecko species looked like being the highlight of the expedition until he was top trumped by Cuban biologist Elier Fonseca. You will tell us. I just collected and um, please do the honors. It's a. Uh, it's... Let's wait and no, no, see. No, no, no. Let's wait and see. No guessing. Stop guessing. Diplodocus. Wait. Even better than Cadea. It's 
Un Anfis Bena. This is an Anfis Bena. <laughs> this strange animal is known as an Anfispanid and is neither a snake or a lizard. They live underground and are very difficult to find. Little is known about their biology, and for Tony, this is an extraordinary discovery. Wow, guys. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Wow, guys. I mean, wow, this is a wow moment. This is the, <laughs> yeah. this is the trip I'll of the wow you. moment. Yeah. My God. Have you, my have you God. seen one before? Yeah. No, no, this is my first one alive. Really? This is my first one alive. That's why I was confused. This is my first one alive. Yeah. This might be a new species. Yes. This might be a new species, yeah. yes. I have no idea of, of what species of Anthisbena is living here. I have no idea. So oh, me neither. I, I wasn't expecting this. I mean, no, this is completely no. out of the frame. We know. It's out of the frame. <laughs> Guys, this surpassed my expectation <laughs> by far. Nice one. Good old idea. There are so many reasons to call this trip the big trip. Yeah. <laughs> the trip of the new things. Yes. The new discoveries. For sure. It's really good. <laughs> Uh. The expedition also documented many insects, birds, and mammals. Their discoveries provide valuable data that prove the importance of this threatened location and will hopefully secure its future. Everybody's life on that boat is changed forever because they will never ever forget that. Many years ago, a farmer from south of the border arrived on the Scottish island of Mull. Here, on the eastern edge of the Atlantic Ocean, he discovered a magical place, full of life. I love the sea, I've always had a deep love of the sea, and it all started there, because I immediately, first thing was I had to get back on the sea again. And I did, got a wee boat, and went find all these fantastic animals. You know what a puffin is. Well, I didn't know what a puffin is. I hadn't got a clue in those days. I knew nothing about wildlife at all except what a partridge was. And uh, here we have parrots at sea. Amazing. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I was absolutely flabbergasted by all our wildlife out at sea, just out this way. I mean, you can see, if, all you've got to do is go offshore here a couple of miles, and you can see just about everything you possibly imagine in the British Isles. Then, in 1982, Richard had an encounter that changed the fate of the region's wildlife forever. This is the story of the legacy left by that magical moment. I was out there one day sea fishing, funny enough, not while we were watching, just south of Col, the island of Col. Calm day, and I saw this dorsal fin in the distance coming towards us, and I was a bit wary of this. Now, why would a dorsal fin be heading towards us? A bit unusual. And uh, it came closer and closer, and got to the point where I was really quite alarmed. Anyway, I leapt on the roof, of the boat holding onto the mast. I can still feel myself doing it and watch this huge animal come straight under the boat, start the other side and turn and come back. The others come back under and round. I suppose it must have been 15, 20 minutes it spent just circling and going under and round us. So there were two things which staggered me. One was the intelligence of that animal to spend time with us, missing all those monofilament lines, you know, which you could actually see underwater. But more important was that animal had decided to come to me and the boat because we were stationary in the water and to spend time with us. And that absolutely cornswoggled me, whatever you like to call it. 
After this extraordinary discovery, Richard became determined to tell more people about the massive marine mammals swimming just offshore. And Vass, I can see him doing it in the wheelhouse, turned to me and said, Richard, you can't do that. No, no, first you must prove it. And that's where it all started, the research. So we had to prove it. To fund his pioneering research, Richard ran trips for visitors to see these extraordinary creatures. And so British whale watching, now a multi-million pound industry, was born. But not everyone supported this new venture. And the tourist board actually tried to close me down for running a con trip off the north end of Mull to go and look for whales when there weren't any whales. It got too big for me, much too big in the end. I couldn't, just couldn't possibly control it. Anyway, I was slowly becoming bankrupt. <laughs> but who cares? As the challenges mounted, it was time for Richard to hand over the reins. So now a new generation is taking up the challenge. My name is Pippa Garrard, and I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust. So my role is to go out and talk to people about whales and dolphins, get people enthused about them, and uh, encourage people to report their sightings and get involved with the trust further. I know when I first started, as I kind of got hooked, and now whenever I'm near the sea, I just have to be looking. I just can't be next to the, next to the ocean without looking and scanning out to sea. So I think it becomes a bit addictive. <laughs> but there is one animal in particular that Pippa would dearly love to spot. I'm not always on the lookout for killer whales. Yeah? But, um, the light... Have you seen the West Coast Marine God? No. No. It's like a dream. Pippa spends much of her time educating the public about the UK's only resident family of killer whales, the West Coast Community Pod. But despite her dedication, Pippa is yet to see any of the group with her own eyes travelling hundreds of miles from the west of Ireland to Scotland's east coast in search of food, the last British orca, are extremely elusive. Out of this west coast community, there, are, there was originally ten animals identified, but we now think that there are eight. These are animals that have been identified by distinctive markings on their fins, um, and we've been able to kind of track where they've been and what they get up to over the years. And John Coe and a number of other of the individuals were first seen in 1992. There is one individual amongst all the others whose fin makes him unmistakable. So John Coe, I always tell the kids, is like a local celebrity. Uh, it's very easy to remember him because of the notch missing out of his dorsal fin. Um, so kind of as soon as you've seen him, as soon as you see a picture of him, you know it's him. However, the future does not look bright for these ocean-going giants. Since scientific studies on them began in the early 1990s, they have never reproduced. Either they're too old, it could be toxins, so things like PCBs build up in their blubber, and um, A, cause them to be potentially infertile, but B, they actually, when they have a calf, they would release all the toxins into the calf through the milk so that will then cause the calf to die. There's a lot to learn about them and it's kind of a race against time um, and to try and learn as much as we can. And so every sighting is important. Uh, so orca uh, or killer whales. Now, if we see orca or killer whales today, you will also see me crying because I'll be so excited. Also the only cetacean species that you can tell the male and the female just by sight. So this is the female here in the background, much more dolphin looking sort of dorsal fin there. Whereas this is the male, absolutely huge two metre um, dorsal fin. We don't really get any warning about when they're going to come. We just see them sort of once or twice a season and they can just sort of pop up out of nowhere. So you never know, today could be the day. Two waters just at uh, 12 o'clock there, four of them. Waters again. What's going on over here? We're looking for it. Okay. Oh, yes! And again! Oh! So it's in, right? So 
in the middle of the left of the trashness and mall. <laughs> Huge fin! Oh. And again, and again! He's coming towards us! Yeah. Oh my god, he's massive! Is it? It's John Coe! I've spent the last two years telling everyone all about John Coe. So to actually see him, for him to be the killer whale that we saw, to me, is personally just really... Amazing! Oh my god! It's what? John Coe! Oh John Coe! It's John Coe, oh my god! <laughs> 34 years after Richard's encounter, it seems a sighting of Scotland's remarkable ocean giants still has the power to change a life. Do you want me to turn around on you? <laughs> Now my eyes are filling up a little bit. Stop it. <laughs> what was that, Andy? I'll die happy now. <laughs> This has got to be what I do. I want to tell people more about this because not enough people know that you don't need to go all the way across the world to see amazing animals. Like, we have them right here. One respects the sea. One must always respect the sea. And never think you're better than the sea or any of the animals actually in it. They're vastly way ahead of us, the sea particularly. We're all way to... No, I'm not going to even that. No, no, no. <laughs> Look, I should, it's time I shut up, for goodness sake.